Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. I'm Eric Schanauer. I'm delighted to be here to speak about Age of Bronze. And I'd like to thank everyone involved with the Key West Literary Seminar for bringing me here. So what is Age of Bronze? It's my comics art retelling of the story of the Trojan War. Age of, Bron Age of Bronze presents the story in full dramatic detail from Paris's days as a herdsman on Mount Ida before he learns that he's actually a Trojan prince, through the wooden horse and the fall of the city of Troy and its aftermath when the Greeks, called Achaeans by Homer's Iliad, depart for home. And I'm not leaving anything out if I can help it. When Age of Bronze is complete, it'll be the whole story of the Trojan War as it's developed over the centuries. I think that no matter how familiar you may be with Greek mythology, you'll find surprises in Age of Bronze. I hope you like surprises. Of course, I've included all the familiar characters. Helen, the face that launched a thousand ships. I based her face on the Peplos quarry from archaic Athens. Odysseus, the most complicated, per complicated, wow, I used that word, personality in the story and Hector, the great Trojan warrior, perhaps the only major character who's just trying to do the right thing. But there are dozens of other characters, some very obscure, such as Eurybates, companion and herald of Odysseus, a character, as Homer reveals in the Odyssey, with African features, Panthous, a Trojan noble and counselor to Priam, and Chrysothemis, the youngest daughter of Agamemnon. This is Thetis, the sea nymph and mother of Achilles. In Age of Bronze, she is no longer a goddess as she is in the, in the traditional story. In my version, she's mortal, a powerful Achaean priestess. That's because the one significant change I've made from the overall Trojan War tradition is that I've removed the gods as actual characters who interact with mortals. I'm certainly not the first to do this in retelling the this, this story of the Trojan War. There's a long history of telling the story without supernatural intervention. I'm not a classicist or an archeologist. I'm a cartoonist. My knowledge of Troy and the Trojan War is all in support of Age of Bronze. I really didn't know much about the Trojan War before, before I began work on this project. When I was young, I read a lot of Greek mythology mostly children's versions from the library. And I think everybody, I don't know if everybody who's presenting today has read the Dowlair's version, but there it is. I loved that as a child too. I loved the stories of Perseus and the Gorgon, Theseus and the Minotaur, and the quest for the Golden Fleece. I thought the movie Jason and the Argonauts was really cool. <laughs> Actually, I still do. But when I was a child, the Trojan War was not among my favorite myths. I got the idea for Age of Bronze when I listened to an audio tape of a book called, that's back when we still had tapes, audio tape of a book called The March of Folly from Troy to Vietnam by Barbara Tuckman. In a chapter discussing the disastrous folly of the Trojans drawing the wooden horse into their city, the author mentions how the story of the Trojan War has spawned many permutations and variants over the centuries. This inspired me with the idea that a complete telling of the Trojan War story, incorporating as many of the permutations and variants that I could find, while reconciling all the contradictions and setting it during the correct historical period, would make a good comic book. At the beginning, I had two main paths of research to travel. My first path of research was to find the story sources. The story of the Trojan War starts with the two epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, composed probably about the eighth century BCE by, according to tradition, Homer. No one really knows who Homer was, if such a person as Homer actually existed. But Age of Bronze is not simply an adaptation of Homer's Iliad. It can't be, because Homer didn't tell the whole story of the Trojan War. Fortunately, many other authors have had plenty of time since Homer to fill in the gaps. Some of these authors were the three great classical Greek tragic playwrights, 
Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, who expanded the Troy story in many of their plays. Virgil's Roman epic, the Aeneid, composed in the first century BCE, relates the sack of the city of Troy in great detail. Another Roman, Ovid, retold episodes of the Trojan War in his Metamorphoses. As the centuries passed, the influence of Homer's Iliad faded. Other versions of the Trojan War gained popularity and spawned further versions, including Joseph of Exeter's version from the 12th century CE and John Lydgate's Troy book in 1420. These are merely two English versions of the story of the dozens that sprang up in many languages, French, Spanish, Italian, Irish, Finnish, German, all over Europe during the Middle Ages. Some Trojan War episodes developed more extensively than others. The story of the Trojan prince Troilus grew gradually through the centuries. Homer's Iliad mentions Troilus only once in passing. Classical Greek art pictured versions of Troilus' death at the hands of Achilles. Around 1335, Italian poet Giovanni Boccaccio in Il Filostrato added Cressida to Troilus' story. In the, in the 1380s, Geoffrey Chaucer composed his masterwork, the poem Troilus and Crusade. The cycle came full circle about 1601, when William Shakespeare wrote his play Troilus and Cressida. In it, he rejoined the Troilus tradition back to the Iliad, which had been rediscovered in Europe and was being translated into English during Shakespeare's lifetime. These examples of story sources, sources barely scratch the surface. And the rich tradition of the Trojan War story goes beyond literature. We have paintings, sculptures, ballets, motion pictures, pop songs, role-playing games, even other comic books. And it just doesn't stop. The Trojan War is everywhere. Uh, Toyota manufactured a car named the Cressida. And I can look under my kitchen sink and find the Ajax cleanser. And whether the subject is computer viruses, or a University of Southern California sports team, or shopping for condoms, you'll find Trojans all around. <laughs> the story of Troy has permeated every facet of Western culture. My second path of research for Age of Bronze, um, okay, I'm off. All right, I'll talk about this. Okay, my intent has been to keep Age of Bronze set firmly in the correct historical place and period, the Aegean Late Bronze Age, the 13th century BCE, so that if the Trojan War really took place, what you see in Age of Bronze is what it might have looked like. Um, I did not want to, okay, I didn't want to follow the long tradition of depicting the Troy story in classical Greco-Roman drag, as in this 1793 engraving by John Flaxman, nor did I want it to look like an anachronistic mishmash, as did 2004's motion picture Troy, starring Brad Pitt. So my archeological research uh, began with the ancient Greek civilization we call Mycenaean. This is one of the better known Mycenaean relics known as the warrior vase. It gives a good artistic representation of armor, helmets, and shields of the time. Some of its details are open to interpretation, but when one has to draw characters wearing this kind of armor, one has to make choices. Uh, here on the right are Odysseus and Euripides outfitted in gear similar to the warrior vase. Many of the Mycenaean palaces still exist, although usually just their foundations are left. The palace at Pylos on the west coast of Greece, where in legend Nestor was king, is one of the best preserved of the Mycenaean palaces. Uh, this is what the site of Pylos looked like after excavation. Well, the floor plan at least is still pretty clear. And this is my guess as to what the exterior of Nestor's palace might have actually looked like. A travel by water was the major means of transportation in a mountainous country like Greece, and everyone's heard of the face that launched a thousand ships, so I've got plenty of ships to draw. A few Bronze Age ships have been found on the bottom of the sea, but they're in pretty rough shape. Luckily, we have pictures painted on pots. And here are some examples of my ship reconstruction. 
These warships from Age of Bronze are sailing off to attack Troy. The gold death mask on the left is one of the most famous objects of the Mycenaean civilization. It's popularly called the Mask of Agamemnon, although it probably dates from centuries before the time of the Trojan War, if the war ever really happened. But I didn't care. There was no way I was going to use anything but this as the face of my Agamemnon. Many brightly painted frescoes still survive from the Mycenaean civilization, but usually just as a lot of little fragments at the bases of walls that archaeologists have to match together like picture puzzles. This charming fresco of a Mycenaean woman seemed the perfect inspiration for Clytemnestra, wife of High King Agamemnon. In the 1870s, Heinrich Schliemann excavated the site that most scholars now accept as the city of Troy, the mound of Hisarluk in northwest Turkey. The city of Troy lasted for several thousand years and was rebuilt many times. The building levels that existed during the late Bronze Age, when whatever conflict took place that inspired the legend of the Trojan War, those levels are known as Troy 6 and 7A. But the citadel that Schliemann revealed to the world was kind of puny. How was I going to bring it closer to the traditional version of a large, glorious city of Troy? Uh, while tr working on this project and trying to figure that out, I discovered an amazing coincidence. In 1988, an international team of archaeologists led by Professor Manfred Korfmann of Germany's Tübingen University had opened new excavations at the site of Troy. In the early 1990s, the archaeological team found evidence for a lower town outside the citadel of Troy, some sort of community that was surrounded by a defensive ditch and likely enclosed by an outer wall. Suddenly, late Bronze Age Troy had grown about 10 times bigger, making it a major metropolis for its time and place, much closer to the image preserved by legend. In the literary tradition, the Trojan, culture seems, the Trojan culture seems practically identical to Achaean culture. But in Age of Bronze, where the visual component is such a large facet of telling the story, I wanted my Trojans to be distinct from the Achaeans. Yet when I began the project, I had no clear clues to the appearance of the Trojans. I attended a symposium on Troy at the Smithsonian, where one of the speakers was Professor Manfred Korfmann of Tübingen, then leader of the archaeological expedition at Troy. I asked Professor Korfmann what he thought the inhabitants of late Bronze Age Troy might have looked like. Uh, he told me to look at the great Hittite empire that extended it, its influence during the Bronze Age throughout the area we now know as Turkey. Korfman's evidence for late Bronze Age Troy being within the Hittite sphere of influence includes the architectural remains, which seem to be Hittite in nature, and objects found at Troy. These objects include a seal with letters in a Hittite script and a figurine of a Hittite god. Korfman's conclusions were good enough for me. So in Age of Bronze, the Trojans are based on the Hittites. The Hittite relief on the left from Yazalikaya shows a god embracing the historical King Tuthaliash, who wears a round cap, flowing robe, and curly-toed shoes. He was the starting point for my version of Priam, great king of Troy. I used Hittite stone reliefs of what have been identified as queens for my depiction of Priam's principal wife, Hecuba. Today, the lower portions of Troy Six's walls and some of its buildings remain, but their tops are long gone. And the top of the Trojan citadel, where the palace would have stood, was shorn away in antiquity. But evidence remains to tell us what Hittite cities looked like. The piece of Hittite pottery at lower right, shaped like a city wall and tower, gave me the look of Troy's walls. From a combination of art and archaeology, I reconstructed what I believe to be a plausible version of the great city. The results provide the set setting for the story I'm telling. This scene from Age of Bronze shows an outer wall flanked by towers, one and two story buildings, people at a well, others taking goods to market, animals, priests, a warrior in a chariot, pottery, and more. 
This is what Troy 6 could have looked like before war broke out. War eventually did break out, so I had to figure out what battles between Trojans and Achaeans might have looked like. Chariot warfare was the order of the day. Chariots are primarily served, uh, used to deliver warriors to the battlefield, and for quick withdrawal, they also served as battle platforms. Both sides used a variety of weapons. Spears are the primary weapon of choice. Bows and arrows are useful for long-range combat. Swords are useful at close range. Both sides use axes and javelins, and sometimes stones are picked up right from the battlefield. Slings seem to be almost exclusively Trojan. Archaeologists have found many sling stones in late Bronze Age Troy. I've been researching the story and the archaeology of the Trojan War since 1992, but it wasn't until the summer of 2006 that I flew to Turkey and visited the site of Troy. Immediately upon entering the site, I ignored my jet lag and hurried to the ruins. Here it was at long last, Troy of the Trojan War. But I felt no overwhelming fulfillment. It was basically what I'd expected, what I'd seen time and again in photographs. I was faintly disappointed but I didn't, but that it didn't seem like a dream come true. But I didn't waste my time on vague disappointments. I was in Troy and determined to make the most of my time there. Of course, I saw things that I'd already drawn. For instance, here's the south gate of the citadel, both as it looks now and as I drew it in Age of Bronze before I saw the real thing. It's not perfect. I drew the stone stelly on the left far larger than they should be. I visited surrounding locations that are part of the story of the Trojan War. I took a side trip to the small island of Tenedos, now called Bojada. The island is important in the Trojan War story. I'd already drawn several scenes on Tenedos in Age of Bronze, and I was curious to see how well they matched the real thing. So I rented a bicycle and rode around the island for several hours, uh, kind of like you can do here. One scene I'd drawn in Age of Bronze featured the Achaean army sailing in their ships along the south side of Tenedos, then swarming up steep hills that rise from the sea. When I heard that the south side of the island today is lined with public beaches, I doubted whether my drawings would find real life counterparts. But when I arrived at the south side, I found that surrounding the public beaches were steep hills rising from the sea, just like I'd drawn, and out at sea, a line of ships moved slowly past the island. They were modern tankers and cargo ships, not late Bronze Age vessels, but I didn't care. For a moment, the late Bronze Age and my present had merged. While at Troy, I saw the Scamander River, now known by its Turkish name, Karamendaris. Here is the ford of the Scamander, where in Homer's Iliad, Achilles slaughtered so many Trojans that the river was choked and finally rose up to fight. When I saw this spot, it really hit home that the geography of Homer's Iliad fits the geography of Troy and its surroundings. I left Troy convinced that whether or not the story ever really happened, Homer himself, whoever he or she or they may have been, knew the place well. One of the advantages of telling this Trojan War story in comics form is that I can use different artistic techniques to convey information. I usually draw in a naturalistic style, but here's an instance when I used a much more representational style, you could call it cartoony, to present an episode involving the great Achaean hero, Heracles. Heracles is not always a character of high seriousness in Greek mythology. There's a side to him that is almost a buffoon. I wanted to bring that out, but I also had another purpose for changing styles. Priam, the Trojan king, tells this episode as a flashback it's a pivotal event from Priam's childhood. My intention was to imply that Priam's memory of the event has become exaggerated with time and his version might not be reliable. Here's another example of a different technique. This page features the head of Agamemnon, leader of the Achaean army. While he agonizes over whether or not to allow his daughter to be sacrificed, he recalls the horrible history of his family, the house of Atreus, a history full of rape, murder, incest, suicide, and cannibalism. 
My hope is that the reader understands that the awful legacy of Agamemnon's family is still part of him, still torturing him, popping up into consciousness to entangle itself with his current troubles. Now, I'd like to share an example of how I combine many sources into a single storyline. I'll use the episode of the Trojan War known as the Sacrifice of Iphigenia. The earliest mention we have of the character Iphigenia is in the play by Aeschylus titled Agamemnon, but that play tells her story only in summary. So I had to turn to a later play, Euripides' Iphigenia at Aulis, which presents the entire episode in agonizing detail. The story goes like this. The Achaean army is camped at Aulis, waiting to sail to attack Troy. But the ships can't sail because the wind isn't right. The goddess Artemis promises to send a favorable wind if the army's leader, Agamemnon, will allow his eldest daughter, Iphigenia, to be sacrificed on the altar. Agamemnon protests at first, but finally summons Iphigenia to Aulis on the pretext that he'll marry her to the warrior Achilles. Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra, arrives with their daughter and wonders why Achilles doesn't seem interested in Iphigenia. That blows open Ap Agamemnon's plot. Achilles, incensed at Agamemnon's false use of his name, offers to defend Iphigenia from the entire Greek army. But in the end, Iphigenia consents to die for the glory of the Greeks. She goes to the altar willingly, and the army sails off to conquer Troy. There are two major variants of Iphigenia's story. In the first, Iphigenia dies, and that's that. In the second, the second version is illustrated by this 1770 painting by Giovanni Battista. Just before the knife is about to descend, the goddess Artemis appears, sweeps the girl up in a cloud to live with the gods, leaving as a substitute sacrifice a deer, or a stag, or a goat, or a servant, or an old woman, or something else. It depends on the particular version. Euripides' Iphigenia at Aulis is a smart and suspenseful play. It was easy to incorporate the material into Age of Bronze. Easy, that is, until I reached the part where Iphigenia decides that she'll willingly go to the altar to die. I just couldn't buy the idea that a 14-year-old girl would suddenly decide to give up her life for an abstract idea like the glory of Greece. Fortunately, I had other sources for the story. In Jean Racine's 1674 play, Iphigenia, I found clues to improving Iphigenia's motivations. In Racine, Achilles and Iphigenia are already lovers. This idea is further developed in Gluck's 1774 opera, Iphigenia in Aulis, which ends with the wedding of Iphigenia and Achilles. For Age of Bronze, I combined bits of every version. As in Euripides' play, Achilles intends to go down fighting in Iphigenia's defense. But Iphigenia falls in love with Achilles and sacrifices her life to ensure his safety. True, she just met him, and her love is closer to hero worship than any mature emotion, but that seemed like an appropriate characterization for a 14-year-old girl to me. <laughs> Another source I used in this episode is more modern than any I've yet mentioned. Eugene O'Neill wrote his trilogy of plays, Morning Becomes Electra, between 1929 and 1931. It's a retelling of the Oresteia, transplanted to post-American Civil War, New England. During a traumatic moment in the play, the character who parallels Clytemnestra makes a speech about her relationship with her husband. That speech directly inspired this scene in Age of Bronze, in which Clytemnestra declares her complete hatred for her, her husband, Agamemnon. Iphigenia in Age of Bronze, just as in tradition, eventually goes under the knife. Her last words, Father, don't grieve anymore, the ships can sail, were inspired by a 19th century poem by Walter Savage Landor titled, appropriately, Iphigenia. Afterward, Odysseus tells the girl's mother the story of how the goddess Artemis appeared and swept Iphigenia away. Of course, Clytemnestra is no fool. She doesn't believe Odysseus for a moment. 
But in this way, I managed to incorporate both variations of Iphigenia's sacrifice, the first in which she dies and the second in which she goes off to live with the gods. The first issue of Age of Bronze was published in November 1998, and further issues have followed since. The comic book series is going digital only with the next issue, number 34, which will be published in a few weeks. Every so often, the story is collected into graphic novels, and those will continue to be published in print. Both the serialized comic book series and the graphic novels are published by Image Comics. I think of Age of Bronze as one long, complete story, and I have a detailed outline of the entire project that I add to as I find new story sources. But Age of Bronze is published serially, so I write and draw one comic book issue at a time. Each issue of, the, of Age of Bronze has, been, has between 20 and 24 pages of art, so as I proceed, I break the story into sections. For each issue, I take enough story to provide a satisfying chunk for the reader. I divide the chunk into scenes and use my outline and my notes and consult, sorry, consult story sources to fill in the details. Then I write the script for the issue. Usually there are between five and eight panels per page. For each panel, I write a description of what to draw and the dialogue, if any. Dialogue consists of the words that go in the balloons and captions, plus any sound effects. Descriptions usually indicate the characters in the scene and their actions. If it's the first panel of a scene, I'll mention the setting. Other pertinent details might include time of day and weather, facial expressions and moods of the characters, and, and important props. I sometimes indicate the panel size and whether it's a close-up or a long shot, but sometimes I leave the dec these decisions till I'm thumbnailing the page since they're subject to change. Actually, everything is subject to change. My first draft of a script sometimes bears only passing resemblance to the final draft, and even then I often change things while I'm drawing the pages. In the beginning, I had to decide upon a style of dialogue. I could have strewn bushels of these thou's and my lords about, but why would someone from the late Bronze Age be speaking pseudo-Shakespeare? I could have tried to imitate Homeric style, perhaps dactylic hexameters, or I could have tried to write dialogue full of contemporary buzzwords in an attempt to seem up to date. But I wanted the characters to sound approachable and timeless, so I chose to have them speak standard, generally unadorned English. I stay away from overt slang and from curses that have anything to do with the, the later Christian tradition like damn and hell. I try to keep the characters sounding lively, though. For example, I had an English translation of a fragment from Sophocles' lost play, The Shepherds, that read, I do you violence and wreck you utterly, striking your buttocks with the flat of my foot for whip. Uh, okay, you, yeah. When I worked that into the appropriate scene, it became much more direct. I'll kick your ass. After the script is written, I make a list of all the scenes, characters, and props appearing in that issue. Anything that I haven't already designed, I do, although that's not totally true, because sometimes I'm like drawing and I haven't designed everything, and as I get to that panel, I, then I have to design it, because I'm lazy. For every new scene and prop, I pull out some of my research in guidance for designing the new elements. Sometimes this research dictates changes in the script. An example of my research dictating a change occurred in an episode where Achilles kills another character with a millstone. Well, I wrote a millstone into the script, but when I looked for millstones from the late Bronze Age Mediterranean or Near East, I couldn't find any true millstones. However, I found grindstones. Millstones, grindstones, they're generally used for the same purposes, and there's not much difference at all when you're using them to kill someone. So sub substituting a grindstone seemed to me to be a valid change dictated by the archaeology. After the script is done and the elements designed, I'm ready to sketch a rough thumbnail plan for each page. This gives me a chance to work out panel sizes, to stage each scene as effectively as possible, to make sure each page is visually interesting, and to keep the narrative flow. When the thumbnails are finished, my framework is firmly in place but not so rigid that I can't make changes. 
I proceed to the final artwork. I draw everything in pencil, generally following my thumbnails. When the penciled artwork is finished, I use a pen to draw the panel borders in ink and add all the lettering and balloons in ink as well. Most lettering for comics is done on computer these days, but I still draw lettering and balloons by hand. To finish the art, I use pen and ink to go over all the pencil lines. Some fine details, such as costume decoration, which I've only cursorily indicated at the pencil stage, now get fully rendered. Once the pages are ink inked, I erase all the uh, pencil lines that are still visible and correct any mistakes and ink smudges. And then I scan the artwork into the computer and do a further round of cleanup. And then I send the pages to the colorist. Until recently, Age of Bronze has been published in black and white. Now that's changed. John Dallaire is the colorist for Age of Bronze. In 2011, John was brought to the project by the publisher of an app for iPad version of Age of Bronze. That version went kaput when the digital publisher went out of business in 2016. But I wanted to publish a print version of Age of Bronze in color. So John continued coloring Age of Bronze. I send, uh, I send John my artwork digitally. Uh, no, I'm sorry. John colors my artwork digitally, and I send him lots of notes on every page. I have final approval so that the coloring stays within my vision. Last September, Image Comics re-released the first Age of Bronze graphic novel, A Thousand Ships, in a brand new color edition. John is currently coloring the subsequent volumes, which will be published annually. And at the same time, John, John is coloring new Age of Bronze issues too, for digital and later print publication. Age, Age of Bronze will just be all color from now on. When the colored pages are finalized, I send them, send them to the publisher, Image Comics. Of course, I have to design and draw the covers for each issue. First, the black and white artwork. Then I color the final cover on computer and compile it with the logo and whatever trade dress the publisher has specified. When Age of Bronze gets collected into graphic novel format, there's more to do. Designing the cover and dust jacket, designing title page and other formatter, plus maps, pronunciation guides, genealogical charts, bibliography, and so on. After what's been a substantial hiatus, the next issue of Age of Bronze will debut in a few weeks. It features Helen and Achilles meeting on top of Mount Ida, south of Troy. This episode is as old as the poem known as the Kypria in the epic cycle, but the Kypria is lost, and all that remains is a summary and a few fragments, so I had to consult later sources for details of Helen and Achilles' meeting, including the fullest version I know of, Walter Savage Landor's Hel Achilles and Helen on Ida, first published in 1853. This is the only time these two central characters of the Troy story meet face to face. For me, it's become an important episode in the character developments of both. This scene also brings back a character who hasn't appeared in Age of Bronze in a long time, Enoni, the mountain nymph who was once the lover of Paris. This certainly won't be the last readers see of her. Enoni's return appearance here is one example of how the life thread of each of the many characters weaves in and out of the huge tapestry of the Trojan War story arranging all these threads into as beautiful and powerful a design that I can keeps me fascinated with working on Age of Bronze. And that's plenty for now, so I'll stop talking, although I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about Age of Bronze or my, or my career as a cartoonist. Thank you. Hi, I, um, I wonder if you could comment on uh, finally graphic novels seem to be getting seen as the art and literature that they are. And I wonder if you could comment on the journey to getting to the Key West Literary Society for, for a graphic novel. Well, I don't know the Key West Literary Seminar side of the journey, but, uh, oh. I mean, graphic novels have been around for hundreds of years. 
Uh, comics have been around for thousands and thousands of years, uh, although what we think of as modern comics have, have been around since the late 19th century. Uh, uh, the modern graphic novel started, I don't know, well, it started in this, I mean, people date it till the 1970s with Will Eisner's A Contract with God. That's like the flag in the timeline uh, about 19, I think it was 78. Uh, then in the early 80s, that was when I began my career in comics and uh, graphic novels were gonna be the next big thing and every publisher was doing graphic novels and they were coming out, but no one saw them. They were only in comic stores, only for sale in comic stores. Uh, so the general, and they never caught on with the general audience. Um, it's been in the past 20 years that graphic novels, as graphic novels are finally uh, penetrating uh, the audience, a general audience. Uh, I guess it, was, you know, it was the late 90s. Manga suddenly became this huge, huge thing. Manga is Japanese comics, and they started being published in the US uh, everywhere. Uh, so about 2001, I'm like, yeah, finally graphic novel. Finally, people know what graphic novels are. I can, like, I can go uh, somewhere and say graphic novel, and people know. some people will know what I'm talking about. Uh, in the, uh, say, 12, 12 to 10, 10 to 12 years ago, I was, I was getting invited to lots of library conventions and things like that to talk about graphic novels, because librarians were very interested in this format. Uh, that doesn't happen so much any, anymore. I think li libraries pretty know, much know what graphic novels are now and are basically accepting. Uh, I, st I speak a couple times a year at various places. I, I, uh, the, usual, the reception is always, always very welcoming and just as it ha has been here, and, which I'm very grateful for. And you know, this weird uh, subliterate form where, you know, it used to be, uh, on TV, whenever you saw somebody reading a comic book, it told you something about that character. Like Archie Bunker could read a comic book. I remember seeing an episode where he's reading an issue of Tarzan. I am going like, what issue is that? <laughs> but I know what everybody else is getting. It's like, oh yes, he's subliterate in some way. Uh, so I, you know, that, there's that, perception has changed to a great deal, which I'm grateful for because it helps me, I mean, it gets me invited to places like Key West. Um, <laughs> actually, um, I was born in Key West. Uh, my father was in the Coast Guard. We left when I was six months old. So I have no memories whatsoever <laughs> of Key West. And, and the first time I came back was last Monday. So I'm very, very grateful. And when I got the invitation to come to, to this, I'm like, yes, I'm going. I would have said that anyway, but it had this ex extra Key West aspect that, you know, I just wanted to get back here. Um, what was your question about graphic novels? Did I answer? Okay. <laughs> More questions? Is that it? There's one over here. Hi, it, this is not so much a, a question as a follow-up for the, the question before. Uh, when I was a kid, I loved Pogo. My dad would bring me a Pogo book when he would come home from work. This is back in the 50s and 60s. And there's one self-referential uh, panel, series of panels in one of the books early on in which uh, I, I think it's Churchy comes to Howland, who is the the owl who is the publisher of the local paper. And he says, is a cartoonist a newspaper man? And Owl says, is a barnacle a ship? <laughs> so you've come a long way, baby. And, and, hey. and Walt, Kelly, Walt, Walt Kelly had you in his sights. Oh, yeah, I would have loved to have met him. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, Pogo, great classic comic strip. Uh, pardon me if you mention this, but I grew up reading, was it classic comics? What were those? Yeah, Classics Illustrated. The classics Illustrated. And I wonder if you were a fan of those as I was. No. Um, <laughs> uh, 
I didn't actually, I wasn't exposed to cl the Classics Illustrated comics when I was a kid. Um, there was a, a sort of a side series, Classics Illustrated Junior, um, that did a lot of fairy tales and stuff for younger kids. And I was exposed to those. I didn't think they were particularly good. Um, some people revere Classics Illustrated, and that's great, but they were never anything that was smack in my radar. But yeah, I'm, a, I'm completely aware of them. And they did the Iliad. What upstairs? <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. You've been highly uh, regarded for the research you did um, to get ready for this. You showed us a little bit of it. Could you tell us about the curiosity and hunger and what drives your, maybe I could use the word obsession, um, with the right details, but it's just incredibly impressive. So if you could tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I want to do it right. And I mean, if you look at my artwork, you know, I draw, I, people talk about how I draw every scale of armor or every leaf on a tree. And yeah, I guess I'm guilty to that to some extent, but I mean, that's who I am. So that's how I approach lots of things in life, just the obsessive compulsive thing. So um, I got this idea in 1991 uh, when the Gulf, the first Gulf War happened. And I don't know if that had anything to do with it. I was looking for a long, I was looking for a long project to do. And I go, the Trojan War, that sounds great. Oh no, that, I would, that would take me about five years. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not, not going to do that, but I wrote down a little note to myself and put it in my file. And, but, you know, and I was working on other projects, but I would go into bookstores and every once in a while, like a book about the Trojan War would like leap off the shelf and grab me and make me buy it. And so I would take it home and go, oh, yeah. And after a while, I was like, yeah, I guess I have enough impetus, enough um, enthusiasm for this idea. So I go, yeah, I'm going to do it. Um, let's, let's do this. But, I've been a, a fan of The Wizard of Oz since I was six years old, and one of my dreams ever since I was a young child was to write and draw my own Oz stories that eventually turned into writing and drawing my own Oz comics, which I did. But I had been an Oz fan since I was a child, so I knew everything that I could, I knew all this stuff about Oz. So doing those projects, I didn't have to do a lot of research. When I got to the Trojan War, I was like, well, you know, I didn't really like the Trojan War story when I was young. I had never read the Iliad or the Odyssey. Um, but the story, I knew the sto outlines of the story, and it was just fascinating. As I said, Barbara Tuckman's book, March of Folly, just the idea that there were so many different versions, and I could put them together made it really fascinating but the visual aspect of setting this story in the correct time period, because you know, it's always, you just, you see like all these Doric columns or Corinthian capitals in, in Troy, in Trojan versions, and it's just like, that's not right. Uh, uh, so I want to do it right. That's my, that's why, and so I, and I, the research is fun. I get to read stories, and every time there's like something new happening, or it's like the characters are doing something that's not in any other version, it's really exciting, because it's like, oh wow, how can I fit this in? And there's, uh, since I've I'm taking the gods out, so there's things that happen in the Trojan War where it's like, well, what am I going to do? Because you got to have the gods in, or there's, there's nobody doing anything, but there's always there's always an answer somewhere in the mass of, of the literary, the story tradition of the Trojan War. There's always something where I can go, oh, that's the answer, how to do this on a human, on a non-God level. So uh, that's fun, too. <laughs> Thank you. Who is your audience? Who's buying your books? You. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I say 14 and up because there's some pretty, I mean, this, my, my line is, the Trojan War started with sex and ended in violence. So, um, you know, there's like heavy stuff that I have to deal with, 14 and up. It's basically, I see it as an adult audience. When the first volume, the first collected volume came out, uh, YA uh, venues really were um, jumping on it. Um, I think they have sort of maybe backed away a little bit because it is, an adult audience. It's intended for an adult audience, not YA, and certainly not middle grade. We've got time for another one. Yeah. Why did you take the gods out? Okay. 
<laughs> because, because I, oh, uh, I mean, there's several reasons. Okay, the flat out, the, the, the bald faced reason is because I was raised as, I was raised as a Lutheran, which is a main, main, mainline Protestant uh, denomination of, of Christianity, but I no longer consider myself a Christian. So I'm like, well, I want to tell this story from a non-supernatural point of view. I'm telling this story because not only because it's an old, a great old story, but because everything that happens in this story is still happening in some form today, that these are how people are. This is humanity. We make no progress. We are the same now as we were uh, 3,200 years ago. Um, so I want to be able to show these characters struggling with decisions, making terrible, terrible decisions, doing things to each other, and ha show the reader that they're doing this because they are making human decisions. In the story, they can say, oh, well, the god or goddess told me to do that, but the reader, I hope, will understand that there aren't any gods in this story. This is, this is that character making that decision to do horrible things to his or her fellow humans, just as we as humanity do today. So that's, that's, I don't know. I don't know if that comes across in Age of Bronze at all, but that was my impetus. Is that it? One more. Wonderful talk. My husband says that the norm of human history is genocide. Do you agree? <laughs> well, uh, I would give I would give a more nuanced uh, answer than yes or no. I'm, I don't. I would love to have a discussion about that, but I don't know if we have time for that. Uh, I don't know if I have even have a real answer. I don't have a thought out answer. I would want to. Yeah, I don't think it's genocide. We're still here, and there's been a, there's been history. Well, and there's a lot of us still here. I don't know. There's a lot of us gone, though. <laughs> Let's say genocide is a norm of human history. I don't know whether I'd call it the norm. Okay? Great. Thank you. Thank you.